Hi, I'm Zivi Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This 30-minute podcast features a new author interviewed by me every single day, 365 days a year for about 30 minutes. I am also the publisher for Zibby Books, which publishes 12 books a year in fiction and memoir. Our books are already out now. You can check it out on zibbybooks.com. And we have a magazine called Zibby Mag, where we have lots of wonderful essays and lifestyle features. That's at zibbymag.com. We have classes at zibbyclasses.com. And I recently opened a bookstore in LA called Zibby's Bookshop at 1113 Montana Avenue at 11th Street in Santa Monica. I hope that you are able to enjoy some of our other offerings. But this here podcast is the basis of all of it and started in 2018. And no matter what I do, this is basically my favorite thing. Enjoy. Alexandra Otter is the author of Don't Call Me Home, a memoir. She is a writer, performance artist, and actress based in Philadelphia. Born in New York City to Mother Viva, a Warhol superstar, and Father Michael Outer, an award-winning filmmaker who directed Chelsea Girls with Andy Warhol. Alexandra has been a featured character in HBO's High Maintenance and has acted in the films of Wim Wenders, Jodie Foster, and Rainer Judd, among others. She resides in Philadelphia with her husband and two children. Welcome to the podcast, Alex. Thank you so much for coming on. Your book is gorgeous. Look at that. Thank you so much, Debbie. It's, it's my pleasure to be on here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Okay. Tell listeners, please, about your memoir. Great. Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> this is like my first interview about it. I mean, I did one other thing last week, so it's very exciting and I'm a little ball of nerves. I mean, oh. right now I'm relaxed, but generally, you know, it's like being pregnant for years and years for me, you know, being pregnant for like 20 years oh <laughs> and, um, and then having a scheduled C-section, you know, because yeah. you know what's coming out, <laughs> but you don't know what to expect if it's your yes. first baby. Yes. Um, yeah, so I started writing this actually at Bard College for my what we called then my senior project. And coincidentally, my daughter is now there and it's where I met my husband, but it was fiction. And so a professor of mine said, you know, let's work on this a little more when I graduated, Elizabeth Frank. And we did, and it was still fiction. And she gave it to her agent, Joy Harris. And Joy said, you know, this is a big caveat. And I had to look up that word at the time. <laughs> uh, but I think it should be nonfiction. And at that time, at least for me, and again, I was in my early 20s, I was, I thought of nonfiction as kind of cheesy. You know, she was like, read The Liars Club, you know? But, yep. And so after I read that, I was like, oh, okay. But I thought of memoir as like celebrity hoo-ha, you know? Fiction was where it was at, you know? This is in the 90s, early 90s. So anyways, I put it away, put it in a drawer. And then, you know, many years passed and I was like, okay, maybe I will. I had my first kid and I was like, well, maybe I will try to turn this into nonfiction, did that. Then another amazing writer who I've always been a fan of, Joanne Beard, who I'm going to be in conversation with near Bard eventually, which is a dream come true. Wow. I knew her because I had a yoga studio and she was a student of mine. And she said, oh, let's, let me look at what you have. So then she helped me. Then I, you know, we just, I couldn't get an agent. I could never get an agent. Nobody wanted it. So I put it away in a drawer. Another 10 years passed. Then, you know, long story short, pulled it out just pre COVID and poked around with some agents and an editor and making a very long story short, managed to find an agent and rewrite the entire thing, do a proposal for Wait, it. Don't make a long story short. Okay, okay, don't, okay. <laughs> I, I was like, just stop me if I'm blabbing. No, no, it's good. <laughs> okay, so what was it? Well, I had, you know, actually, I have to say like Instagram really made this happen because I was, I'm like the only yoga teacher you'll ever meet who's retired. Like, cause it doesn't happen. Cause you know, you can't retire if you're a yoga teacher. So I did these kind of satirical Instagram videos and I got this New York times profile. And so the woman who profiled me said, you know, we start talking, she's a writer. And I said, I had this book hiding in a drawer, you know? And she said, well, you're going to sell this after this profile. And I just didn't pay attention because I don't know. I was like, whatever, I'm almost 50. I'm not going to sell this fucking book. Sorry. My <laughs> yes, you are. I have a very naughty mouth. So that's okay. Bring it. 
So I did take that and I was like poking around with more kind of yoga, autobiographical essay style things. And then through this process, a lovely editor, Jim Martin of Riverhead, who I managed to get in touch with and had been a fan of my yoga teaching, said, well, what do you really want to do here? Do you want to sell your old book or these essays? Or, you know, do you want to write it? And I said, my old book. And she said, well, let's do that. You know, so she just connected me to a list of agents. She was like an angel coming out of the blue. And Mariah Spence at Janglo Nesbitt was like, let's do this. And it was about a year, really, of getting the proposal together. You know, because I had this old manuscript, huge manuscript, you know, very big and dense and way too complicated and way too long. So we turned that into a proposal and Mariah helped so much. I mean, without her, I don't know, you know, just so much of crafting it and getting it to look good. It was an 80 page proposal and yeah, she made it happen. And then I said, you know, I really am worried here that Armageddon's going to happen before because it was during, you know, it was like leading up to the election between Biden and Trump. And I was like, I think something <laughs> bad's going to happen. And I don't care about the rest of the world. I just want to <laughs> see this book in a bookstore. <laughs> I'm kidding. I do care about the world. <laughs> but so then COVID happened and I was like, I fucking told you. I was like, this, the world's going down. So I just, I actually gave up on it again. Cause I was like, this is never going to happen. Like we're going down. So yeah, then she did eventually like a year into COVID, she was like, we're going to send this out. And I really actually did feel like this was my last chance, you know, kind of for this, not last chance in life, I had a lovely life, right. you know, <laughs> love my kids, love my husband, blah, blah, blah. But it was a dream that I will say was eating at me, you know, like that I had given up on. And I was like, well, I guess this didn't happen in life, you know, and that and I'm, I was like, had to kind of reckon with that to just set that aside. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So waiting for the calls, you know, you I'm learning and I was learning all this as we go along. What's a call? You know, you've got a call with so and so. And I was like, so I'm auditioning for them. And Mariah was like, no, no, they're auditioning you. And I was like, mm, I think <laughs> I, no, I was like, I'm auditioning, right? And they were like, no, you're auditioning them. And I was like, no, they're auditioning me. And so when we got our offer from Viking with my amazing editor, Meg Leader, I was actually sobbing and crying. <laughs> it, was, it was the day before Biden won. And so it was, you know, I don't know if you remember how tense that was. Yes. And I was just so tense for so many things. And yeah, so we happened to have a school bus at the time. My husband bought a school bus to like travel during COVID. What? Yeah. A humongous school bus that we had like a bed and a couch in. And um, we got in the school bus and drove around Philadelphia, Mount Airy neighborhood of Philadelphia, celebrating both for my book deal and for Biden. <laughs> oh my gosh. And random people would get on the school bus. It was really for the election, but I, you know, also was for my book. <laughs> You're like, that might be their celebration, but here's what I'm celebrating. Yeah, here's really what I'm celebrating. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was actually like another, I mean, don't know the exact time, but like another year or more to actually finish the book after that, you know? I oh think my it was, gosh. Years. It was a long time. So yeah, so here I Here you are. Well, oh my gosh, congratulations. What a and victory. you were the first person who my publicist was like, so here, you know, when she first started putting stuff out, she was like, you're going to be on... The Zibby podcast. And so I had that in my little, I still write things down, you know, by hand in an address book. And so I've literally been like, Zibby podcast, Zibby podcast, Zibby podcast. <laughs> like I was sitting here at like 10, 15, like here. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're so funny. Uh, well, I'm honored. And as soon as I got pitched your book, I was like, yes, yes. Thank you. I can't wait. Um, okay. Content of your book. Let's go there. What made you keep coming back to the story, your family, all of it? Okay. Yeah, that's a hard question. You know, why did you write it? You know, and you get these like grids, you know, from the marketing and publicity team. <laughs> I, like, I don't know, Myra, it just happened. Um, <laughs> I had to write it. But on some levels, true. Like when I was, you know, way back when I was like, this is the story that I'm writing. I, I knew, I guess I knew there was, you know, a very idiosyncratic thing with my story that I had this one, many of us have kooky moms, high maintenance mothers, you know, it's a, it's a definitely a trope, a theme, obviously in memoir, women and their mothers. But I knew that because my mother had been this Warhol star and because I'd grown up in the Chelsea hotel 
And I was of this era, you know, born in 71 and a teenager in downtown Manhattan in the 80s. And, you know, my mother at that point was on the periphery of the avant-garde art scene. She was also enmeshed in our world. So I was like, okay, there's something definitely unique. And I want to tell here that I felt compelled to tell. But at the heart of the story was really this you know, a love story, I guess, and I sound a bit pessimistic here, but as all love stories tend to go awry, I feel, I knew there was a love story here between my mother and I that, you know, falls apart. So again, classic themes, but Viva, my mother being who she is, I also felt very compelled to just write her, to describe her, because she's one, so funny. And I hope people get a lot of you know, laughter and humor from the book. And there's a lot of dark humor too. And two, she appreciates dark humor. So I, there's so much that she rants and says that was running through my head that I think I was sort of compulsed and compelled to write it down. But, you know, I think at that time I didn't have necessarily the voice, you know, yep. clicked in, which is maybe why I had trouble finding someone to like trust it and want to bring it out into the world. And so I think all of the aging process over the years gave me that perspective. So I ended up kind of snapshotting into what I call the now in the book, which takes place here in this house in Philadelphia, like one Christmas in 2018, where my stepmother, my mother, my sister all gather here. And they're obviously the, these major characters in the book. And you kind of get a little, little crumbs and clues as to how it all turned out. Because I think there's definitely times in the book where one might be like, God, did they survive this? You know? Yep. So we did survive and, you know, Viva's still around and she's an older woman at that time. And it's a bit of comedic relief as well, I hope. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's a universal story in the sense of, you know, women, it's very, I do also think it's very feminist. It's like women enduring each other <laughs> yeah. and women enduring, like each other and just enduring. Yes. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's so funny. You know, we published a book this month called Burst, and the main character is Viva. Of all, no, yeah, that's so funny. I saw that book, and I'm excited to read it. Yeah, Viva and Charlotte are the characters. And in fact, when I originally got sent your book, I forwarded it to Mary Otis, and I was like, "Can you believe that this is the name? Like, maybe you should change that's your character." So wild. And had do you think she had ever heard of Viva, my mother? I mean, I don't know. I did. There was no recognition there. She was just like, "That's what so funny." Yeah. So Warhol gave that name to my mother, and I still, I actually have a very casual friend who named her daughter Viva, not after my mother, I don't think, but I actually can't deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't. I'm like, I don't want to see a child named Viva. But, uh, yeah. How did everyone in your family handle the fact that you're writing about them and that this is coming out? And like, how do they feel now? And how are you navigating that whole landmine of yeah. emotion? You know, I'm not sure. Maybe you can help. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like in kind of gentle denial, I think. I mean, my father and my sister, who are the main people besides for my mother, my birth mother, my and my stepmother, who happens to be a famous artist, Cindy Sherman, my father's no longer married to her, but we're very close with her, my sister and I. So they have been so wonderful. My sister's a huge, enthusiastic supporter of the book. My father as well. Like, he's French. And he was just like, what? it's so wonderful. That's great. Like, he doesn't care. <laughs> I can say, like, I can kind of say anything about him. He's he's an artist. And also in the true sense of the word, like, he would never challenge or question somebody's choice to make their story, you know? So I could have portrayed him as like a, you know, junkie in the gutter. You know, he'd be like, that's fine. If that's what you think, you know? And I, <laughs> it's cool, man, you know? So my mother, Viva, on the other hand, yeah, I think she hasn't read it and I project it'll probably be a bit difficult. And she read a version way back when, and she was a big supporter of it. It was a very different version. I've been very relieved that the reactions are like, this is a love story and this is beautiful and people relate to Viva. So I would love for her to see that I don't know she will. And yes, I have fear. I have nervousness. I have denial. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, you know, we've mostly always been in touch. We're, you know, gently estranged right now. Mm -hmm. COVID did some things to us, her perspective on it, which you might be able to read into. And, um, and I wasn't, I could handle that really, you know, like that's okay. She's, I'm used to that with her. 
but she did get fixated on the book and what she assumed was the story and I had, I hadn't finished it. So yeah, it's, you know, hopefully not going to be a, a horror show, but <laughs> I'm happy for her to tell her story. Like I said, I had a New York times interview last week and I, I gave the lovely journalist, my mother's information. I have no problem her saying, you know, her side of things. And I, absolutely respect that she has a different version of things, you know, but I don't think she believes other people's versions have legitimacy. (laughs) Completely understand. Yeah. I wrote a memoir and my take was just to, I don't know, very selective portrayals. Not that they didn't, I mean, everything I included did happen. There was just a lot that I did not choose to include that would just make life miserable because a book comes out and then that's it. Everyone's on with their lives, but it can wreck, it can wreck everything oh my God. for the rest of your life. Yes. So. And I've heard family members not speaking to each other after that. Did you choose to give the book to certain family members to get their approval? I did. Yes. I did. I gave it to almost everybody who was in the book who had a major role in yes, the book. Yes, yes. Like, I didn't give it to, like, random ex-boyfriends. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Although I, I thought about it, but... I know. Nor did I. I thought about it, too, and actually... Yeah. I was, I was <laughs> counseled not to, because there yeah. is a large section of uh, the, the boyfriends that are... And it's, you know, slightly inappropriate, because I was a young woman very attracted to older men, and I guess vice versa. Um, <laughs> to me. But, um, so... I protected some people by changing names and did, and did give it to those closest to me, like Gabby and my dad. But um, the, I think, you know, once those who are listening, read the book, you'll probably get a good idea of why I maybe didn't give to my my mother ahead of time. Yeah. I think most mother, I will go on a limb and say, I feel like most mother daughter memoirs, the mother has not necessarily read the book or reads it at a very late stage or, or not at all, you know, maybe, you know, or not at all, or finds it totally incomprehensible that this could be the memory yes. and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it's, you know, I, I love mother daughter memoirs. And so I have, feel like I've interviewed a lot of pe- women in your exact yes, situation. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but it's fine. In fact, yeah. Ariel Levy, did you read? Oh yeah. Yeah. Levy, yeah. yeah. So you know, that was... It's intense. Yeah, I love that. It's intense. I love that too. Yeah, very intense. And, you know, and I always call it, like, for mine, even intense light, you know, because it's not, yeah. like, there's nothing that bad. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, people have gone through much more intense stuff that they write about, which I'm so, like, in awe about, you know, really, like, laying out there, like, you know, it's just, like, a histrionic mom, you know, who, who like, rants a lot. So it's, like, at the end of the day, like... She's not being accused of anything, which is what makes me feel, you know, better. It's like if she disagrees with the story, it's like she disagrees with who she yelled at when, you know. (laughs) But But I think your life is just you had so much glamour and like it's just crazy. The culture that to have Cindy Sherman as a stepmom. I mean, that's crazy. What I mean, how is that? (laughs) I know it's so funny that you say glamour, Zibby, because um when I was upstairs in my bathroom quickly putting on some face makeup, which I've never used in my life, like skin makeup. (laughs) And then also in the basement, that's like stinks of kitty litter and realized I was almost late because I was brawless and like trying to sleep laundry because I'm leaving for Costa Rica tonight to teach a yoga retreat, you know, reluctantly to teach a yoga retreat. I was like, ah, so unglamorous, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny, you know, I think a lot of people think this, you know, it didn't feel glamorous. Do you know what I'm saying? And we weren't, yeah. I think we were boho glamour for sure, you know? When my dad got with Cindy, she was barely known at the time. You know, she had just put out her untitled film stills and she lived in a loft apartment in the fish market, which was not like the fish market, it's not the Fulton Street fish market, like the, you know, and with the bathroom in the hall, you know, like a shared bathroom in the hall and the shower in the kitchen. So that was, yes, glamorous in the sense, you know, of like this idea of old New York. And I do find that glamorous, you know, and I kind of have even my own nostalgia and miss that. But yes, the reality of the situation was the Chelsea of, you know, Edie Sedgwick or what we see. It wasn't really like that, but I did love it. I loved growing up in the Chelsea and it was actually really kid friendly. I mean, you know, if people are okay with like cops and transient riffraff, (laughs) but, you know, you didn't need a key. Like everybody knew me. I was practically born in the lobby. So it was like I could come in any time of night after going to like Nell's or the Palladium when I was like 15 and Jerry, the desk man, 
who was there when my mother was born would be like, hey, Alex, you know. So in a strange way, it was very safe, you know, safer than how I feel my teenage daughter who's now in college grew up in Philadelphia, much safer. You know, you don't drive a car. So if you're drunk, you just walk home or take the subway. And, you know, I basically had this doorman building. But yeah, so, you know, when you're living in it, it doesn't feel like glamorous. But in retrospect, I wish I could go back now and be like, ah, living the glamorous life, you know, because I would feel that it was glamorous. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm just doing laundry in the kitty litter. <laughs> How have you dealt with so raising a teenager and all that. Oh. I have two teenagers at the moment. Oh. So any advice is very you welcome. You have more gray hair? I do. You know, <laughs> I have like literally no advice. I think it's a like fucking shit show that's so, you have to like negotiate every single day in a different way. Like I have friends were like, is this normal? And they send a picture of their kids, let's say whole collection of vape situations, you know? And I'm like, yeah, that is totally normal. I have seen that for sure. I don't know what you should do about it. Like, like I really, I'm like, I have no idea, even though I already dealt with it. But like, you know, I always say, I mean, not you know, because you don't, but what I do always say to people is, if your child feels that sense of love in their core, you know, if they feel loved, like truly loved, like somatically loved, even if it changed, like before the age of 10 years old, if they got that, you know, you could be like bat shit crazy and they're kind <laughs> of okay, you know? But I think it's those children who have not experienced that where things can go awry. And I'm not saying that when things go awry, like I don't want to say you're saying something dark here, but let's say your kid ends up in rehab or worse. I'm not saying that that doesn't mean they were loved like, you know, weren't loved like that things can go badly, even if they're loved. But I just think if, despite that, yes, things can take a dark turn. I think there is, if they have that core sense, there can be negotiations, there can be understanding, you know, a sense of trust on some level, even though they're going to lie out their teeth most of the time, you know? I don't know. I hope that's true. I just said that for the first time. Now it's recorded. I could be complete bullshit. Okay. I'm going to go with it. I think it's good. I'm going to, I think it makes sense. Um, I'm, I am, that tracks with my own experience yeah. as a teenager, yeah. for sure. Yeah, so, same with yeah. mine, actually, well, you know, because I did feel that. But I, uh, you know, I also say, like, whatever they're telling you, like, it's possible they're totally being truthful. But I'm always like, they could be like, oh, yeah, you know, that was my friend's thing, or I've just done it once. And meanwhile, they're running a whorehouse in Calcutta, you know, like, like doing eight <laughs> balls. Like, but you, like, believe that they're, like, oh, the sweetest gosh. little angels in the world, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. What are you going to do to celebrate if you are already like yeah. re- <laughs> retrofitting a school yeah. bus just for the, yeah. for the deal news? What is your, what is your oh, celebration? Well, you know what it is. Like? It's going to your luncheon, Zibby. Yeah. Because no, no really? I honestly <laughs> believed that when I sold the book, Viking would be like, and now we meet at the Odeon and open champagne over steak free. And it's like, no, here's a Google doc. Like you'll never meet anyone in person. Like, you know what I mean? So like, Like, I was like, really? I'm not, I don't get like invited to the office. At least I was imagining like 1970s publishing world, Joan Didion. Yeah. So when you sent, I mean, I know it wasn't you personally necessarily, but when I got the invite for authors and their editors and I saw the address and like looked at the picture, I was like, oh baby, I am in. I'm probably like the first person to RSVP. (laughs) Well, I have to tell you, my, my daughter's bat mitzvah was supposed to be over zoom and it was supposed to be in this place. And I kept postponing a year at a time, you know, can I keep pushing back my credit, blah, blah, blah. And finally they've said to me, you can no longer push back your credit, but you can have the space for the whole day. And I'm like, then I am going to make a day of it. So I thought I would do this. I came up with this fun idea for a spring author luncheon. Cause I met a spring author and I'm like, you should meet all these other spring authors who I've been interviewing and who I have coming up. I bet you'd all really like to know each other. So then I was like, I'll just do like an author thing. And then I don't even know what occurred, made me occur to invite people's editors. But I was like, I bet that's interesting. I bet editors never, oh, I know what it is because I was going to invite my author's editor who I adore, Bridie. And then I was like, well, I bet she would like to meet other editors. And so then I thought I'll just invite the editors. But then like every hour that I have something for my younger daughter at five and then my older oh daughter. My God, I love it. I love it. I'm so <laughs> thankful that you're doing that. I was like, woo, my a luncheon. Yes. Like I'm actually being not sarcastic <laughs> at all. I'm so looking forward to it. 
But yeah, and then, you know, I have some fun stuff in New York City happening. You know, New York City. <laughs> You've heard of it. <laughs> the, on pub date, launch date, my friend who's the designer, Rachel Comey, and she's been hosting some stuff. So I'm doing a thing with her and also an old casual friend, Parker Posey, who's the most wonderful, actually, woman in the world. So that's really fun. I'm excited to, and, you know, to get an outfit, Shh, Rachel. Ooh, and then I've got something at McNally the next day. So definitely will be exciting. And, some, and then I come back to Philly, but I'm taking myself to Los Angeles. Nice. You know, because when you're a 50-year-old unpublished author, you know, they don't really pay for your travel. <laughs> so I'm flying myself to L.A. to be with Maggie Nelson at Skylight. That I'm really excited about that. And then, um, and then a little thing near Bard. It's not a lot, you know, it's a few things, but I'm thrilled with it. No complaints, except that I would like a first class flight to London. <laughs> Maybe for the paperback. Exactly. Thank you. Please. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're in LA, go by my bookstore and sign your books. Oh, I want to do that shop. so badly. I realized, I know I looked at that and I said, I need to do that. All right. I'll have my people call your people. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I would love. Yes. That. Yeah. Because oh, that's all. I only right. have the one thing at Skylight with Maggie. And when are you going to be out there? That's um, May 17th. May 17th. I don't think I'll be there, but obviously the store will be. Okay, should I? I'll tell them. Yeah, I'll do that. I would love that. And I already had planned to come by the bookstore. I'm so not used to this. I didn't even put it together that I would have a book. Do you know what I mean? I'll be like, I'll go look at Zibby's bookstore. Not even thinking, you know, my own book. (laughs) This has been so fun. Thank you for like, I really needed a laugh today. And this was just like, totally entertaining. I could just oh like my listen to you all day. So thank you. That was really fun. Thank you so much. I so much appreciate it. It's really <laughs> meaningful to me. Oh, awesome. Okay. Well, I'll see you at our lunch. <laughs> okay. okay. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.